Thank you, Lee and company. I have to tell you, God uses his church to connect people, among other things. And there are connections that get drawn over time that you, you just can't put a price on. Lee went to Lodi Academy. He's a Lodian, and there's another Lodian in our, or was a Lodian in our midst, you all know very well, Brenda Moore, who was the director of Glendale Adventist Academy Chorale. She also was a Lodian, and um, their teacher was a wonderful man, is a wonderful man named Mr. Hugh Wynn. And Hugh Wynn was the principal of Fresno Academy when I was pastoring in Fresno. So Hugh and Betty were members of my church there, and I got to know them. And so Lee and I are connected through Lodi, even though I never lived there. And that's the way God works sometimes uh, when he connects people to himself and to one another. So we can start with a word of connection, I guess, is one, one thing we can do. Words are uh, interesting things. We have talked about words a lot in the last year and a half, and I don't mind repeating myself because I think sometimes we lose track. We have a civilization that comes from a uh, Western tradition but with Eastern influences. And the Eastern influences were based in oral tradition. So what we have when we look at our Bible is an oral tradition. The Old Testament is an oral tradition that comes to us from ancient times. This oral tradition eventually found its way into writing. And writing was the domain of the very few, the elite, the highly educated. And it became the instrument of empires and of religion. Writing became a powerful resource for putting words into a form that would exist exactly as written over time. Now, oral tradition is very accurate. Oral tradition changes very little. There are still cultures today where you can find people who can speak for 24 or more hours nonstop the history of their tribe, repeating names of ancestors and telling stories of their past. They have memorized this oral tradition, meticulously memorized it from the one in their tribe who had it before and so forth. And so the oral tradition, the history of a people that is what we would say illiterate, but clearly uh, uh, not so in the, in the more meaningful sense of the word, in that they use and have words that speak and capture and preserve a history. These oral traditions have existed for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So for a long time, word was an oral tradition. It was something passed from generation to the next, from one educated person in the tradition to the next person to be educated and so forth. There had to be redundancy, obviously. What if somebody had an accident or injury or plague that prevented it from being passed along? And so people have had a way of preserving word over time until it did come to written form. And then the beauty there was words could be locked except they really weren't because they didn't have Xeroxes. There was no way to transmit these words except to copy them. And interestingly enough, when you copy page after page after page, you're likely to make about as many mistakes as you might if it were well rehearsed orally, maybe more. So the word became written. But somewhere along the way, written word began to carry authority that was very, very powerful. If it was written, it must be true. And so as the record of God's interaction with humankind came to be recorded, it came to possess an even greater authority for those who would read it in subsequent generations than it had already carried in the oral tradition. Why is that interesting or why is that important? It's because we now live in a world in which writing doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's true. So you go onto the internet and there's a blog and you read it. It's the written word, but is it true? Or is it opinion? Or is it spin? You read a news story. Are we reading this news story from a liberal perspective, a conservative perspective? 
Is the perspective what makes it true? Or is the facts as they approximate reality what makes it true? We live in a world in which politics and semantics merge to make events murky, not clear. To protect those who engage in all that's necessary and sometimes not necessary and even illegal or atrocious to make a society go forward or to maintain power. We live in a world in which words are now used as weapons more than ever. We live in a world in which words hurt as often as they heal. We live in a world of rhetoric, of argument, of case making. We live in a world of presentation and perspective and appeal, and the written word has been diminished. We live in a world of the National Enquirer. Do you realize that tabloid type materials have grown exponentially since the 70s and 80s? That our appetite for e news is not just the same as it's been in the past, it's greater than ever? That we're just as interested, in fact, more interested in Paris Hilton for whatever reasons I don't have any idea, or the Oh, anyway, I digress. Name a celebrity. We're more interested in that than a story of true tragedy somewhere or true nobility somewhere else. And so words, while still immensely powerful, no longer carry for us the authority, the clarity, the truth, that they used to. We must recapture that. You see, our duty as Christians is not just to proclaim that God is God and that Christ is his son, the one who reveals the Father, but we need to reclaim the message that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God in him was life, and that life was the light of humankind. There's something powerful about the notion of a living word, the one who speaks. We've talked in weeks past about the generativity of word. God hovering over the waters of the deep. Words being spoken, let there be light. Let there be this and that, and it was so. Words generating, creating as it were, out of something or out of nothing matters not. Whether word becomes an organizing principle or something that makes something out of nothing, ex nihilo, it's power. Word is generative, creative power. It makes something. It produces something. And God is always making something. He's always creating. And in the story of the creation of earth, it's word that brings us into, cre into being. It brings the planet into order. When Jesus and God are there creating Adam and breathing into him the breath of life, some of you may recall, when he is given the task of naming animals, it isn't the task of God taking a steno notebook and writing down the gibberish that Adam might have said and saying, oh, he said gaga when he saw that animal, so that animal is now a gaga. Adam engages with God and learns the animals, and when he speaks, Many of the old names speak to the kind of animal it is. They have a generativity of their own. The naming itself is shaping. That's what we do when we classify animals into kingdom, phylum, class, order, etc. We begin to give them a family and a shape. 
We begin to understand them in a per, per, certain classification, and we have clarity about that and power through the power of word. You know, word continues to be important all the way through scriptures. If I took all the time it would take to say how powerful word is in every single case, we would be here several days with me just talking about word. You have a name. Right now, I want everybody to just speak your own name out loud, please. Gregory. That was lovely. Good job. Nobody was even shy about it. That's terrific. Okay, now I want you to say your name again, and then immediately after, I want you to give the two or three five-word description of what your name means. Ready? Gregory, watchtower or watchful one. Your name has a meaning, yes? And that meaning, hopefully, was part of why your parent gave you that name. That meaning, hopefully, is a part of who you are because in naming you, something powerful happened with you. My parents named me Gregory. It means the watchful one. Okay. That has been a shaping part of my life, and it has also fit who I've become. Watchful one. Words are powerful things. They're powerful things. And in the context of faith, words are what we live by. So I want to get to the text. We have a couple of texts I want to spend some time with this morning that share with the, us the power of word in some very interesting ways. David Barber just read from Deuteronomy 8, and I'd like you to turn to Deuteronomy 8 again in your Bible in the pew Bible ahead of you, or if you have your own Bible, that's just fine. Deuteronomy 8 is where we're going to start today. And I want to point out a few salient details as we go through this. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of what is called the Pentateuch, or the Torah. First five books of Scripture. And in Deuteronomy 8, we read... This is the word of the Lord. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. So the first word that God speaks is, follow the commands I have given you because this is the keeping of covenant. If you keep your side of the covenant, which is to obey the commands I have given you, I will keep my side of covenant, which was an oath I swore to your ancestors, to multiply you and bless you and bring you to a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of promise. Verse 2, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. That's a powerful passage. First of all, we have that admonition to remember. Now, remembering is an interesting thing, isn't it? I'm going to digress for just a moment. Remembering is a powerful thing because when we remember something, we're remembering something past but it isn't truly in the past, right? The past is gone. So we're taking something from the past, a recollection, and we're pulling it into the moment now, yes? Remembering is not passive, it's active. And so when we remember something, we give a shape to it. Now, if we're to remember rightly, this is something Miroslav Volf talks about in his book on memory. Fantastic stuff. I urge you to read it. In Miroslav Volf's book, he talks about memory in this sense. He says it is our duty to remember rightly. And what does he mean by this? If we remember in a way that diminishes a wrong that was committed against us or something traumatic in our lives, we end up diminishing ourselves and hurting ourselves and creating a second injury 
in addition to the event itself or the memory. If we make those who've hurt us or the trauma of a past greater than it actually was or our enemy to be more of a villain than he or she actually is, then we commit a crime against them. We per perpetuate something evil against those we remember more harshly than they deserve. So he makes the case that we need to remember rightly, and as we remember, we're bringing the past into the present, so we have choices to make in the present about how this past comes to us and how it affects us. God invites Israel to remember. It's an active verb. He says, remember the way I led you in the wilderness and tested you. Yes, Israel was to remember the hardships and the trials but as Peter was talking about earlier when he was talking about his life, he doesn't want the emphasis on faithfulness to be on him. He wants the emphasis in faithfulness when he talks about stewardship in his life before God to be God's faithfulness to him and his family. Did you catch that? He tried to be very clear about that. And in the act of remembering, God is inviting Israel not just to remember the hardships and the difficulties and their faithlessness, he's inviting them to remember the way in which he provided for them and led them and cared for them and met their needs in a very hard place. He's inviting them to remember rightly their moments of disobedience and the pain that that caused. He's inviting them to remember rightly the graciousness of God who forgives them and restores them and brings them back. And he invites them to remember how though they wandered 40 years, they did end up in the promised land. He fulfilled his promise. So when God says remember this, there's something incredibly happening with the power of words, only that the words passed and the actions passed and all that's evoked in that. He humbled you, verse 3, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna. manna. Oh, that's hard. That is hard to be diminished, to have such great need, to be utterly dependent, to be pleading. He humbled you with hunger and then fed you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. This was a new food. To teach you that people do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That is a familiar phrase and we're going to get to it in Matthew 4.4 4 shortly. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during those 40 years. That's saying something, isn't it? I see people who wander around Pasadena for three months, and their shoes are worn out, the bottom of their pants are frayed, their zippers are broken, uh, they're dirty, 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 dirty. And yet Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and it says... Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. What had God done for them? Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. God was trying to shape his people. And what is the way that shapes most of us best? The crucible of hardship or pain. Verse 6, observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where your bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. If you live in the Bronze Age or earlier, this is a very good land. It still is today. Verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget that the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. What's the analogous point today? we just been through an economically very difficult time. Some of you were upside down in your houses. Some of you had cutbacks to your jobs. 
Some of you have gotten your jobs back. Now your houses are worth what they were before. Have you forgotten the Lord? Is it no longer necessary to cry to him? When he's brought you through this valley back to a level place, have we forgotten how to praise him, how to thank him, how to remember what he's brought us through, where we've been? The stock market's hitting incredible highs right now. If you have anything in a retirement fund anywhere at all, you are wealthier than you have ever been in your retirement fund. Was I not just a few years ago saying that I would have to work until 90? Do you remember that? Me talking about preaching till I was 80 or 90? Because a retirement fund was so much in the toilet? Okay, is there any security in today's stock market numbers? No. It can turn to nothing again tomorrow. But who is still God? And whose word still sustains? And whose promise still goes forward? And who's going to carry me forward, whether I have a million dollars in a retirement account or $100,000 in a retirement account or $10,000 in a retirement account? Who's going to carry me forward? Oh, I don't hear you. God, God, okay, I guess God. Don't ask me to smile about it. God is going to take you forward. He's, he's there. He is the Word, the one who generates everything from his mouth, who speaks and it is, who promises and it comes to be. All he asks is that you are faithful and remember his commands. And Jesus has framed these for us. We don't have to be shy about this. It's love God supremely. Nothing else takes precedent over the love of God in your life. And to love your neighbor as yourself, that's the tough one. What we have to see is ourselves accurately in order to love our neighbors as ourselves. Because when we see our neighbors as arrogant, we find the arrogance within. When we see our neighbor as a jerk, we understand the jerk that is within, and so forth. Please don't embrace your inner jerk. Embrace your inner nerd. There we go. Wisdom for you during the sermon here. Verse 15, he led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my, the power and strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. Any Simpson fans out there? All right, thank you, Abigail. Do you remember the Thanksgiving one where Bart is asked to give the Thanksgiving prayer over the family meal? And he says, well, God, it looks like we paid for all this stuff ourselves, so thanks for nothing. <laughs> Amen. That's Bart. Yeah. Profane as that is, it speaks to our own level of gratitude most of the time and a level of awareness most of the time. We are tempted, as Deuteronomy says, to say, the work of my hands has produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed like nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God Ever heard the doctrine of the remnant? Ever heard anybody say we're God's remnant church? We have the faith of Jesus and the spirit of prophecy. Revelation points to the end of time and we're living there and we're God's church to carry the three angels' message forward at the end of time. Have you heard that? Yes. If you just read Deuteronomy, you know that's conditional. You know that if we cease to obey or cease to be the people God's called us to be, somebody else will be called to take our place. God will have a faithful people, will it be us? Let me ask that again. God will have a faithful people, will it be us? The word of the Lord has spoken it. Now, I want you to take the Deuteronomy passage we've just read in all of its wonder and move it into the time of Jesus who's just beginning his ministry. In fact, he's just been baptized. 
The Spirit of God has come upon him, and he's called into the wilderness. Now, how long was Israel in the wilderness right there? according 40 years, okay? And how long was Jesus in the wilderness? 40 days. 40? 40? Do you see any symmetry there? Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. We'll get there in just a minute. Jesus is tempted, and the first temptation he's given in his hunger is he realizes that he is very hungry, and the devil appears to him and says, take this rock and turn it to a loaf of bread. Could Jesus have done it? I suppose he could have. I'm thinking he probably could. The word that spoke and made all that is could probably turn bread and I mean stone into bread. I'm thinking that would work. And he says, "Don't tempt me." He says, "It is written. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone." but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus was going to come back from that experience. He was going to call his disciples, and he was going to spend time in Galilee, which was a land of olive oil, a land of wine, a land of fish, a land of lake, a land of breezes. It was lovely. He was going to spend time in the promised land after his desert wanderings. And we're all doing the same. We're living our lives in this desert, as it will, it were. And Santa Clarita is a great place. Glendale is a great place. We're all very blessed. Sometimes I think we're oblivious. But we're being moved somewhere. We're being called to eat a bread that's not of this earth, a bread of heaven. We're being offered water to drink from which we will never thirst again, the water from the well that is the word of God, that is Jesus. We're being offered eternal life, not just life we have here and now. We're looking forward to a promised land, as Israel was, one yet to come. Turn to Matthew very quickly. I know our time is running short, but I will will have you see this because it's it's camp meeting. Yeah, thank you. It's camp meeting. We're here till one, two. It's okay. Lock in. We're going to be good. Jesus tested in the wilderness. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now, I just want to make a parenthetical comment because a lot of people get stuck on this. After he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, it is, I think, proven that it is possible for a human being to live without food for 40 days, but not common. Most people die of starvation after anywhere from 8 to 20 days. Most people cannot go uh, this long. And if Jesus had, in fact, been without food and water for that long, he would have weighed somewhere in a 70-pound range. He would have had to have had water. He would have weighed somewhere in the 70-pound range. He wouldn't have had any strength. He wouldn't have had any presence with which to walk back to uh, where he had been before. So we're left with a couple of options. Either the number's literal, and he was sustained miraculously by God in this time. Miraculously sustained. He really didn't eat, and he was miraculously sustained for that time. Or the number which I think is, is more likely, is designed to, to reference and help us remember another experience of God's provision, the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. See, Israel wandered and God provided. Jesus went to the desert and the angels ministered to him. In the desert, they were tested by God to see if they would remain faithful to the commands of God And they failed many, many times. Jesus, by contrast, was tempted in the wilderness and tested in the wilderness by the devil and passed, citing each time Deuteronomy, every time, referencing a text in what we we would call the Old Testament. 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So that 40 number could be understand by, understood by a faithful Christian to be something other than 40 literal days or nights. It could be a reference back to Deuteronomy from which Jesus quotes and his 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Israel's wandering in the wilderness. Jesus is the type to the antitype, and he comes offering us life anew. He comes with words of life, offering us bread of heaven, waters from which we'll never thirst again, ultimately offers us a trip to the tree of life and access to the river of life in a kingdom made new, one that will never end, and one in which the sin and suffering and wilderness wanderings that we experience are to be no more. This is the full circle of the word. Word that creates, word that redeems, and the word that restores. The word that takes us to a new place in our understanding. A word that feeds us from bread that falls from heaven in the wilderness of old to the bread that is the Christ when he says, take, eat, this is my body. We come full circle as Jesus is tempted in every way as we were. It says in verse 11, the angels came and attended him. In verse 12, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. So somewhere along the line, this ordeal ends for him and his ministry begins anew and in earnest. But I just want you to hear today how Jesus paid attention to the word himself and how these words came to be life, life for him and life for all of us. Because if he had yielded to hunger and turned bread to stone, this would still be a world belonging to the prince, not of peace, but of darkness. We'd be in a different kind of reality. Words would have a different kind of meaning and power. But thanks be to God, who has saved us in Jesus Christ, we have him, the living word. One who's never sinned, never broken covenant, never fallen short in the wilderness, never lost faith, never lost sight of what is and what can be and what will be, and never ceases to invite his people, one and all, to be faithful.